Okay, so our last panel is on local communities, and I'm very pleased to uh, bring on stage to announce this last plenary, Jennifer Roberts. Uh, she is the sector director for the Path to Positive Communities program at Eco America, and she also is the former mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Megan, and thanks for everybody for hanging in here. <laughs> we're batting cleanup, which means we had Senator Whitehouse, we've had two amazing panels, and we're the third, so we're going to be the home run. <laughs> Woohoo! So, um, I'm Jennifer Roberts. I represent the community sector for Eco America. Um, the community is where we bring everybody together, right? I heard some folks yesterday say, we're hearing all about federal and state things that are going on. What about local politics? local community, local connections. This is where we can bring the health, the faith, the business, the nonprofit folks together is in our local communities. I forgot, I have a clicker. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this, okay. So you may recognize some of the mayors of our country here. Um, I'm wearing the same suit. <laughs> <Basically>. <laughs> As if I needed to stand out more, right? <laughs> but we, um, mayors around the country and council members and, and county commissioners have worked to do what our federal government has not done, that's stay in the Paris Accords. And so local governments can really make a big difference. And the Path to Positive Communities program for Eco America, it's a mouthful, but that's where we go to our local communities. We work with national partners. Um, so here are some of the partners we work with. The National League of Cities, which reaches all 19,000 of America's cities. Um, we also work with the, the climate mayors. We work with the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. We are trying to reach into every community. And we know how diverse our communities are. So what we rely on is our local partners who know who the players are, what the state regulations are that they operate under, who the different demographics are in their region. Their minorities are different in every city across America. The geography is different. The type of energy they have is different. We rely on our local partners to be those voices who really know what's, what are going on, what's going on. And we are really grateful. I know some of our partners are in the audience, and we're really grateful for you. So um, we've had a lot of successes working with these folks. I just want to briefly talk about what's happened in Utah. Um, you can see we actually helped them design a website, Path the Positive Utah, that includes resources from Eco America that helps them reach their community leaders, helps them bring leadership circles together, and to message in the right way that is neutral, that is nonpartisan, that it's gonna be able to reach everyone because we have in America, I think more, almost two thirds of our mayors are Republicans. The big city mayors, a lot of them are Democrats, but we have, we have to work in both places. And so we have seen amazing change in Utah. Um, five years ago, you couldn't talk about climate change. They have passed, since they became partners with Eco America, um, we have seen them pass two pieces of legislation, one which, admitted climate change was something they had to plan around and was a real concern for the state. The second just passed a few weeks ago. It allows Rocky Mountain Power to bring communities to 100% clean energy if those cities make a commitment that they want to go 100% clean by 2030. This is in conservative Utah. So we have, we have done, Mitt Romney has said climate change is real. Um, we won't talk about Mike Lee, but <laughs> folks, you know the Utah politics. Um, but this, you'll see there's a, a picture here of um, the mayor of Salt Lake City, Mayor Boskowski, unveiling some of their charging stations as they continue to push for um, electric vehicles, and they can continue to expand the light rail, which they put in place for the 2002 Olympics, which came to Salt Lake City. So these are some of the things that, that Pat the Positive is doing, that Eco America is doing on the ground in our cities, where the rubber meets the road, local communities that everyone can have influence over, that everyone works in. All politics is local, 
But as I reminded folks when I was mayor, not all authority is local. <laughs> so you still have to partner with state and federal governments, but starting with your mayors, your community leaders, your, your local faith and health leaders can be a great way to bring people together. So if you remember one thing about communities, we're the connectors, we're connecting. And we're gonna hear from folks today about how they've connected and some really exciting things going on in our cities and communities. So now I am gonna introduce our moderator, um, who is also one of our partners um, with Climate Resolve in Los Angeles. It's hard being a third panel. You've already heard all these great things talked about. But Los Angeles is doing amazing things. And Jonathan Parfrey has been part of that. Um, he really is uh, the embodiment of what we try to do at Eco America, bringing sectors together, bringing different viewpoints together. Because before founding Climate Resolve, Jonathan was a commissioner at the LA Department of Water and Power. He helped found the statewide alliance of regional collaboratives for climate adaptation. He served as the LA director of physicians for social responsibility. And he founded and directed the Orange County Catholic Worker. Not all at the same time, <laughs> different things. Uh, he also was appointed to Governor Schwarzenegger's environmental policy team in 2003. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Parfrey. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, and, and please stick around. We, okay. we need you, we need say. you. Um, I, let's, let's reflect on the difference between yesterday and today. Loved yesterday, but one of the interesting things about yesterday was it was very theoretical. And haven't today we've been hearing about action, about things that are happening on the ground. And that's what this panel is about. It's about things that are actually taking place uh, in our city so that I think provides a sense of optimism that we can uh, rally together to take action on climate change. In Southern California, let me just share a few statistics with you. Our local utility, Southern California Edison, is going to be at 80% carbon free within the next 10 years. By law, they're supposed to only be 65%, but they're gonna be at 80% carbon free. On the way to 100% carbon free, as the rabbi observed, but in the year 2045, thanks to SB 100. And all utilities, in every part of the California's industry is supposed to be carbon free by 2045, according to executive order. But if you fly into Los Angeles, going into LAX, you can look down, you'll see nothing but city, you'll see big freeways. And so we do have a number of intractable problems, and they're real. Transportation emissions have actually been rising rather than declining. Our air pollution problem remains uh, huge. Um, the sprawl problem, if there's a spot of open land, someone's building a, a single family home on it. And so with the help of Eco America, uh, Climate Resolve has the Path to Positive Los Angeles program, spearheaded by a wonderful coworker, Christina von Hoffman, who's in this audience right now. And, <laughs> The work that we did is putting Angelinos in the climate picture, taking where they are, taking their expertise and rallying it to climate solutions. And one area that we worked on was forming a coalition called EnviroMetro. And that coalition helped pass something called Measure M that uh, Ms. DuPont Walker uh, now gets to oversee the allocation of the billions of dollars that voters said, we want to deal with the transportation problem. We want to tax ourselves to deal with the air pollution problem. And so this Measure M is building new subways, new light rail, new rapid buses, new bike lanes in car-heavy uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so this is an exciting new um, area in Los Angeles. And some breaking news, uh, just this last Monday, uh, Mayor Garcetti announced his LA's Green New Deal, the new sustainability plan. 
So Los Angeles is a city of four million people, and by 2035, 100% of our wastewater will be recycled. 70% of our water that we use will come from local water. Currently, we import 90% of our water. We will be carbon-free, as I observed, by 2045, and in that process, create 400,000 new green jobs by 2050. One of the areas where Climate Resolve has really participated with the city is in preparing for the effects of extreme heat. And in this area, we have been the champions of cool roofs and cool streets. And so in Los Angeles today, there are a few miles, there are experiments of cool streets, of pavement that haven't been painted white. It's People use the word paint a little bit too liberally, but it's a treatment of a slurry seal on the asphalt that reflects the sun's energy, bounces it back into space. It's a very small piece of geoengineering, perhaps, but it's a way which where we cool down the city of Los Angeles and at the same time get at the heart of the climate problem. It's an experiment, and we hope to report back on that experiment. Now, Los Angeles County is 10 million people, and they've released what I think is one of the best sustainability plans out there. And we work with even a larger body called SCAG, wonderful name, Southern California Association of Governments, that oversees 18 million people. And our organization, which is guided by the work that uh, Eco America has, has led us towards, um, is working on a resilience plan for the 18 million people in Southern California. So I just want to give you a flavor of what's happening in LA. And unlike Las Vegas, what happens in LA, I think leaves LA. And <laughs> we like that idea. But now I would like to introduce you to our esteemed uh, panel that's here. First up, our currently elected official is Hattie Portis-Jones, and she is a second-term council member of the city of Fairburn, Georgia, where she develops policy and acts laws for the well-being of Fairbanks's, Fairburn's, excuse me, 14,000 citizens and ensures the proper stewardship of its resources. She's on the national board of the National League of Cities and serves on their legislative action committee and is also the chair of the National League of Cities Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Policy Committee. Now, we have Brendan Shane, who is the climate director for the Trust for Public Land. And he is charged with shaping the land protection programs there to protect communities from climate threats and reduce climate pollution. And I know Brendan from uh, the Urban Sustainability Di uh, Directors Network a few years ago, where Brendan was the chief of policy and sustainability for the city that you're now in, for Washington, DC, where he led the efforts uh, across agencies and the community to develop sustainable DC, the city's first comprehensive sustainability program. And maybe you could talk about the new uh, resilient Washington plan that just got released as well. That's right. And now we also have Lori Tremel Freeman, and she is the executive officer of the National Association of County and City Health Officials. And prior to joining Nacho, that is their name, Freeman served as the CEO of the Association <laughs> of Maternal and Child Health Programs. And last but not least, and you know her already, uh, Jennifer Watson Roberts, who is the director of the Path to Positive Communities program at Eco America. And as you've heard, she is the 58th mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, where she signed the mayor's climate pledge and became part of the global covenant of mayors for climate and energy. And Jennifer is also the proud recipient of the Maya Angelou Women Who Lead Award and Equity North Carolina's Ally of the Year Award. And now, um, Council Member Portis Jones, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much um, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, Eco America, for inviting me to serve on uh, this panel. Uh, I have learned so much uh, in the past 24 uh, to 36 hours. Uh, I have taken copious notes, uh, a lot to take back to my community. I got uh, involved in this work, uh, quite frankly, by accident. Uh, my issue was about quality of life. Uh, I, uh, my community is South Suburban Atlanta. We are about 25 miles outside of the city of Atlanta, but we serve in the same county as the city of Atlanta. Um, you said that my population was 14,000. I just saw a document the other day that we are a little over 15,000, <laughs> and we're counting. Uh, we're hoping that when the census is done, um, we will uh, be uh, officially over the 15,000 uh, mark. But when my husband and I moved to the community, um, it's a community that was about 140 something years old, but uh, not uh, a substantially growing community. Lots of trees, lots of wooded areas, uh, places I could walk um, with my dog, uh, very little traffic. Uh, but we had this premier uh, park that I just absolutely love. And uh, some issues uh, arose relative to the park that really piqued uh, my interest as to what was going on. But at the same time, uh, a new development subdivision was being planned. I saw the subdivision. Uh, I saw them working behind the trees. And then about two or three days later, I saw that every tree had been decimated. I had a problem with that. So I talked, uh, went directly to City Hall, talked to my um, council member, um, one in particular, uh, and uh, to the governing body at large to say uh, that I thought that that was a major problem. Trees have major value. I didn't know the environmental value. I was thinking economically and real estate values. I was thinking about quality of life in my community. So trees became my issue. And that's how I got involved uh, in this issue. Fast forward, I decided to run for elected office. And it was because of the park that I had mentioned earlier uh, um, to run for office. All the ways I always talked about quality of life. Good quality of life and health, as we've learned, if we've got lots of trees. Good quality of life, as we've learned, if we have green space. Good quality of life, as we have learned, if we are an active community. Good quality of life, as we have learned, if we establish policies that ensures and guarantee that we have good quality of life. So one of those major legislations was a tree ordinance that the city of Fairburn passed. It's not a normal tree ordinance. Ours is very stringent because we wanted to maintain the tree canopy in our communities. We wanted to re um, maintain the legacy of those trees. And we wanted to maintain the quality of life of the high real estate. So, that began the work in terms of establishing policy and learning more about climate change, what that means to my community. And just because I am a community of, at the time, 13,000 or less, or now 15,000 or more, doesn't mean that we can't have an impact and do the same thing that my big sister, Atlanta, does. <laughs> So I began watching what they did relative to the whole climate issue and started having conversations about that. I will just close with saying, how many of you have uh, been to your city council meetings? Wonderful. <laughs> how many of you have educated your council members about this issue on climate change? Wonderful. How many of you have taken people with you 
to discuss this issue on climate change. The numbers are less. <laughs> and that's my challenge and my charge to you, is that you show up, that you speak up, because we, one, need to be educated about this issue, and two, we need to know that you care, and three, when you show up in mass, we pay attention. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's really exciting, actually, to be able to follow the councilwoman. Um, I could almost take my couple of minutes and just say ditto, but I will, I will provide some examples because um, you um, and many of the conversations here today are just um, really inspirational in terms of the creativity, the innovation, and in particular, the focus on building community as the uh, path forward mm -hmm. to, deal with, to deal with climate. So uh, I'm with the Trust for Public Land, and our, our mission is to create parks and protect land for people and to build on your theme. That's to ensure healthy and livable communities for generations to come. Uh, we heard yesterday in the Breakthroughs for Nature about one critical element of nature, right? This is literally God's creation uh, to the invention to capture carbon, and it needs to be part of the climate solution in a much more significant and massive way. We need to have forests, we need to have greenery on a national, in a community and a national and global scale to help deal with greenhouse gas emissions. At this point, though, there's enough damage done that the heat is coming, the storms are coming, the fires are coming, the water levels will rise, and um, greening uh, is necessary. Bringing nature back into our communities is critical to protect us. So it helps us cut down greenhouse gas emissions uh, and lock them up for the future, but it can play and must play a much more important role in protecting the communities we live in, particularly those communities that are most at risk, hit first, hit hardest, low-income, communities of color, uh, disenfranchised. So I'm going to talk about a simple breakthrough uh, solution, which is build more parks. And um, why, you may ask? Well, to the, to the physical reasons to do that, uh, as you mentioned, the environmental benefits. Um, as storms grow more intense, parks can protect people from floodwaters. And so not far from, uh, from Fairburn, in, in Vine City neighborhood in West Atlanta, um, uh, they, it's a historically impoverished community, and they faced, uh, they're a low-lying community that has consistently been flooded. In 2002, it reached really uh, critical conditions with flash floods that destroyed dozens of homes, damaged hundreds of others, and people were being pulled out of windows uh, to be rescued in the city of Atlanta. Um, there are a bunch of ways to deal with that type of issue, but in this case, they chose to build a park as a solution. So this summer, uh, for those of you here nearby, you should go see Cook Park, a brand new 16-acre uh, state-of-the-art city park that provides really badly needed green space access for everyone, but at the same time, it's specially engineered to capture and filter millions of gallons of storm water to reduce the risk of flooding for that community going forward for generations mm -hmm. to come. Uh, parks also play a critical role in cooling as the summer heat grows. So in Philadelphia, some of our colleagues from the Philadelphia team are here. There's great examples in a schoolyard program, and, and one example is the William Dick Elementary School. Many of you may know Philadelphia is our largest uh, and poorest community in America, so 25% of the people there live in poverty. Uh, and you see that in the condition of parks. You see that in the condition of schoolyards. So at this particular school, it was an asphalt lot, which you see in, in many communities still today. Um, and on that lot, the surface temperature would consistently, routinely be 115 degrees or more. So not a, an ideal place for the kids to play, not a healthy place for the kids to play, and not a community asset. So our team in Philadelphia working with the school, the kids, the teachers, and community members, most um, from the entire surrounding community, created a, a water smart playground and a green space that stays cooler on hotter days and actually then captures storm water and creates a community amenity and a safe place to play. They also took a park, uh, an asphalt lot that was fenced 
and turned it into a green space that was open. And so that created access for 14,000 people that live in the half mile around that park, essentially a new community park that becomes um, a place that they can use every single day. And so I, I wanted to just take one minute to talk about the social, uh, social side of that, because it really can't be overstated. This isn't just about creating the space. It's about how you create the space and the fact that parks are a convening space. That's where communities come together. And so to the extent we want to move toward bringing different people together, uh, setting new policies, building new movements, you have to have a place to do that. And the park in the community can be that place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> next. Yeah, good morning, everybody. So, um, Nate, it's Nacho, by the way. We like to think about public health in terms of, not in terms of nachos, so Nacho. Um, <laughs> but we get it a lot, so no worries. Uh, but across the country, um, our local health departments, and there are about 3,000 of them, are really tasked every day with addressing the many health um, risks and outcomes that stem from climate change. And these communities are um, really susceptible, as you probably learned a lot about yesterday, to increased exposure to um, in geographic reach of vector-borne diseases like Zika and Lyme disease, exasperation of respiratory illness due to um, worsening air quality and pollution levels rising and food shortages and all kinds of other issues associated um, with climate change. Similarly, um, we are dealing a lot with preparedness and response activities associated with increased frequency and intens intensity and adversity of weather events, um, floods and wildfires and hurricanes and other public health threats to communities bring about a whole other host of public health issues like waterborne disease and heat-related illnesses and displacement and mental health. Local health departments really work on the front lines with their communities to identify and mitigate um, disproportionate exposures to environmental health hazards. They ensure non-discriminatory compliance with environmental health and safety laws. And they also work to assure that there's proper siting of hazardous facilities, adequate payment for hazardous waste cleanup, and fair land use laws and policies um, assure that they are in place in communities. According to the US Global Change Research Program Climate Health Assessment, and this is a quote, every American is vulnerable to the health impacts associated with climate change, everyone, all of us. Um, some, of course, face greater risks, and the health impacts of climate change, we know, disproportionately affect already vulnerable and at-risk populations. In terms of environmental health and policy, um, this is an area where our local health departments work within their communities, and we have the ability to increase awareness among decision makers and other stakeholders about the environmental public health implications of policy decisions. And as citizens of our own communities, I like to think of it in terms of not us versus them, but we are them, we are part of our community, and we have the same advantage um, and ability to motivate others to get engaged in their community meetings, to represent themselves at the table, to protect themselves against some of these hazards. We know that in terms of environmental justice, um, the fundamental prerequisites for population health are peace and shelter and education, food income, a stable ecosystem, sustainable resources, social justice and equity. Vulnerable populations that are most affected by environmental hazards through inequitable policies include pregnant women, children, racial and ethnic minorities, the elderly and the disabled. So it's a broad group, it's not just racial although that's a very, very important part of it, but it also um, includes all kinds of other um, folks in the community that are at risk. Um, I also wanted to mention that immigrants and refugees, refugees are emerging populations of concern because of, they have limited choices of where they work and they live. 
Um, and they also are more susceptible to um, other disease um, like asthma and high um, blood pressure, lead and obesity, lead ex exposure and obesity. Up to 200 million climate refugees are expected to be displaced by 2050, and this represents another um, disproportionately burdened community um, by environmental strains on their livelihood and poor health outcomes. And then finally, just to sort of close out, I do have a good example um, from a local health department who's working in the state of California to um, to actually educate their community on what they can do to make an impact in San Luis Obispo. They have created a campaign to educate the community about the health impacts of climate change and spur them to action. Their program is called We Take Health and Climate Change Personally. And this program includes um, a lot of different aspects of education and engagement with the community but they have some really good resources, one of which is um, the journey of an apple, which is meant to show even children at the youngest age what it means to eat an apple from a, a local farmer's market and where it travels less than 10 miles to get into your hands versus an apple that takes 2,000 miles to get to a grocery store and go through a lot of different processes, including um, you know, all kinds of changing of the apple's original <laughs> nature um, to get into the hands of, of the folks that, that eat it. And so there are good things happening in our local health departments. I'm happy to share other examples of this with you, too. Thank you. Okay. So once again, I'm batting cleanup. So um, I'm going to tell you a couple stories. Uh, something you may not have thought about was cities and what cities are dealing with with climate change. I'm from North Carolina. North Carolina got hit by Hurricane Florence uh, about six, seven months ago. We're still dealing with the impacts. The cameras go away, the news crews go away, people whose lives have been devastated and ruined are there to try to pick up the pieces. We've been trying to get FEMA money, we've been trying to get state money, it's never enough. Um, the latest grant that I saw the governor applied for was a mental health grant of $11 million because families are still traumatized. And this was the hurricane that sat for four days and poured buckets and buckets and buckets. And a week after the wind and the storm had left, the flooding was still rising. That's how much water was in eastern North Carolina. A third of our counties, we have 100 counties, a third of them disaster areas. There's still $2 billion of damage to schools in the area. So kids are going to school with mold in the walls. And as you can imagine, a lot of these schools, because it's a rural part of North Carolina, a lot of these are low-income communities. These are rural communities, these are small towns. When the cameras go away, people forget. And this is one of the reasons I am so passionate about the equity piece of climate and climate justice, but also about bringing communities in to prepare and to be ready. And the climate refugees and the people who cannot find work again, the people who cannot afford to move, what happens to them? And something that you might not have thought about, I was sitting down with the head of, we have the North Carolina League of Municipalities, which is kind of like the National League of Cities for our state. National League of Cities is our partner here. Um, <laughs> So I said, what, what are you most concerned about with the cities and towns in North Carolina and dealing with the climate, climate crisis, climate change? He told me that there are as many as 100 cities in North Carolina that will disappear in the next five years. And the reason, they're not going to just float away. The people will stay. But the cities will unincorporate, possibly. We hope not. But this is the thing he worries about, because they don't have the money to, to rebuild their stormwater systems or their water systems or their police and fire. They don't have the tax base, right? These flooded properties are losing value. So pretty, people aren't employed. They're not paying sales tax. They're not paying income tax. So pretty soon, that city recognizes we can't survive. Last year, two cities in North Carolina went away. 
The city councils had to go home. The mayor went home, city staff was fired. They put all their services onto the county. And the counties in North Carolina are thinking about this as well. You know, how are we gonna take on this additional burden? What is gonna happen if all these cities can no longer survive as entities? And this is the first time that I had heard this real, you know, you talk about justice and equity and electoral influence and ability to have a voice and, and the local support for services and how near and, and urgent this is in North Carolina. And this is a state that passed a wind moratorium. Our legislature passed a moratorium. We couldn't do any wind. They also passed a law about four, four years ago that said you cannot use science in planning on the coast. You're not allowed to use climate science. Like, in a law, they said that. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the challenge that we're working with in communities. Okay, one second to tell my second story. <laughs> my second story is one of hope. Um, my friend Greg Stanton, who was mayor of Phoenix, and now is a congressman from Arizona, tells this great story about how there are breakthroughs. There are things that can help your um, folks recognize there are solutions that benefit everyone. He was trying to expand the transit system in Phoenix. And he recognized that Mesa, Arizona, very conservative suburb of Phoenix, they had to go through Mesa to make the transit system work. Because we know these things are better when they work regionally, when they bring in more people and they have more miles they cover. So he was trying to figure out, how am I going to get the Mesa residents to vote for this transit bond? Well, Governor Mike Levitt in Utah, Republican governor, had been there when they expanded the transit system for the Olympics in 2002. So he invited Governor Levitt to come and speak at a conference in Phoenix to talk about how you can be a conservative and support transit. And you know what? It works and it's really good for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so after that conference, the residents of Mesa, who were part of this conference and started talking, et cetera, ended up voting for the transit bond. Bond passed, rail, the rail was built, and now the residents of Mesa are some of the biggest users of the transit system. So there you go, bipartisan um, collaboration when it's a win-win, when people see the value, that can work as well. Let's hope we can do that in North Carolina. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So in the few minutes we have left, um, I wanted to ask the panel one question before we turn it over to the audience. And the question is, um, there are other intractable problems that you're facing at the local level. Uh, in Los Angeles, uh, structural racism, lack of housing, smog, sprawl, transportation problems, inequity. Um, these are really big issues but they all have an intersection with the climate issue. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to perhaps opine for us on how those intersections can be helpful or harmful um, within your own local government. So, council member, please. <laughs> um, well, you can't talk about one uh, without the other. Uh, just recently, uh, a, a proposal was brought before council regarding uh, uh, a, a development apartment uh, complex for our downtown area, which, you know, we have a plan. We want to uh, build density downtown. Uh, and, um, but the location that was being pr proposed had a huge impact on legacy communities uh, surrounding it, uh, increased traffic, uh, regarding that affordability of the units um, was an issue and the whole quality of life uh, regarding it. But because uh, of all those challenges, and even though we want density downtown, the council unanimously denied uh, that particular uh, project. And so those are kind of the hard decisions that we have to make uh, and competing decisions as well. And I'll just add one other thing. Um, when I uh, came on council, I, I encouraged my colleagues, uh, I said, we want to, um, we need to do a rebranding because I had heard from citizens as I was out campaigning, 
talking about um, they wanted Fairburn to be a new city, a progressive city, and that um, you know we didn't have the feel and look of that. And so we did the rebranding, and overwhelmingly everyone said, we want Fairburn to be progressive, but we want to maintain that small town quality of life feel. So that is our everyday challenge, and that is the question we have to ask ourselves for every decision that we have to make. So they are competing interests, and we have to take all of those into consideration, but uh, sometimes you know, we don't get what we want at the time, but that doesn't mean we don't reassess and uh, reevaluate and see how we can address that issue from another perspective. If, if I may, how does this play out at the National League of Cities as well, the, these questions of other intractable problems with the climate issue. Oh, very much so. Um, the scenario, quite frankly, is uh, very similar. Uh, serving as the chair of the Energy Environment um, and Natural Resource Committee, one of the issues that uh, we are evaluating and wanting to make some decision about advocating is uh, what they call PFAS. Uh, it's a contaminant that's uh, been around for over 40 years. It's used a lot in firefighting, uh, but what I have found is that it is sort of in our everyday products, like toothpaste, like um, a Scotch Guard, and many things. But it is now showing up in our waterways. And we are collaborating with the Military Community Council to deal with this issue, and we will be having conversations with community and economic development. So all of them over, overlap, uh, and it's, uh, it's an environmental issue, and, but uh, it affects all of us. Thank you. And, and Ms. Mayor, could you shed some light on climate and intractable, other intractable problems that you <laughs> faced in Charlotte? Well, I think, and it's interesting that you work with cities and counties, that, that Lori works with them, because I think one of the challenges is silos. Mm -hmm. um, we have local government, we have a school board, we have a city council, we have a county commission. So our city council passed a 100% clean renewable um, goal for 2030, but they didn't affect the school board, mm -mm. and they have 1,200 buses that are diesel buses that the kids are breathing the fumes from every day. Mm -hmm. and so. That's the county and the state working to fund that. So we have all these silos. Um, and at the same time, the county, which hadn't had an environment committee, reconstituted its environment committee. It hadn't had one since I left, which was 2012. But the city, after passing that great thing, disbanded its environment committee. So we have, you know, it's kind of up, one, down, two. But, but I think the, the siloing of uh, different government entities and the need for more, I know there are regional collaboratives that are forming that have great impact. I know you're doing that in California. Thank goodness. Um, we have councils of government, but they don't have the authority and the funding. They really need to have the voice they need. So, you know, I just encourage collaboration, um, the cross-sector, uh, cross-jurisdiction, you know, looking at regionalism because Charlotte and, you know, D.C. and all these places are, you know, the city is small, Atlanta is 400,000, but the metro area is millions. And they all, they all use the same transportation, they all breathe the same air, they have the same storms. And so we need to get better at connecting. You know, I remember I said connecting. We need to get better at connecting in non-traditional circles and engaging more deeply and recognizing that you're serving the same community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, let's, let's get more organizations like Nature, mm -hmm. did I say it right? Yes. <laughs> that involves cities and counties yeah. um, and, and get them at the same table. The built environment is really important, but counties are doing public health. You know, those things have to be, mm -hmm. housing, that's so important, that's all connected. Thank you for bringing up uh, climate collaboratives. Uh, we do have one in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's called LARC, LA Regional Collaborative for Climate Action and Sustainability. It's a long name. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have the major institutions in Los Angeles talking about climate together and doing some of that common planning. And in our audience tonight, uh, we have Kate Meese from the Local Government Commission. Yes. And Kate uh, is the executive director of Local Government Commission that oversees the, the Sacramento Climate Collaborative as well as the statewide collaborative of the collaboratives where there's shared learning among the various collaboratives. 
So it, it, it is possible to get out of those silos and develop joint plans. And I'm happy to report the LA County Sustainability Plan and the LA City Sustainability Plan is beautifully integrated, as well as the state one. So we work often with the governor's office to integrate all this planning as well. So, Brendan, could you well, reflect on was intractable just, problems? Well, and maybe just to build on what you're just saying, I think that one of the most exciting things about this effort in Eco America and the discussion we've had about moving across constituencies and sectors, the comments earlier about congregations are people who vote. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the kind of um, silos, it, I mean, that is like if you, a, the big problem often for people. Money and silos, probably a couple of the big problems. But w one of the ways those get broken down is when the community, different community members come knock on the door of the local leaders and say, this is what we want. We want you to work together. We want, um, we want more green space. We want to protect uh, a particular issue, or we want better transportation. And so uh, I think that uh, you know, finding, the, finding an issue where people can come together uh, and mobilizing these different constituencies with the moral authority they have, with the expertise they have, uh, is probably one of the best solutions to breaking, helping break through this. That's great. Mm -hmm. Ms. Freeman. Mm -hmm. Um, not much more to add. Probably just that there's opportunity always to we we know there's always less money, um, but there there's a lot of duplication of effort too, and there's a lot of opportunity to leverage the way we work together in different ways for better outcomes. And I think um, whether you're a member of a community. Um, uh, a business partner, local government, what have you, you need to see yourself in um, w w where you fit into the problem and the solution. And then um, there are ways to convene partners and come together for these solutions and leverage all these efforts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to leave a, a phrase out there for if we wonder where we can get resources on climate adaptation. There's a thing called local hazard mitigation plans. Mm -hmm. And if your local hazard mitigation plan could be dedicated to dealing with some of the effects of climate change, mm -hmm. you can receive some funding from FEMA, granted if your state agency, emergency services agency, allows that to flow through to the local municipality. But mm -hmm. there, there are funds that are on the table now that are currently not being a uh, accessed. So, uh, local hazard mitigation plans can be a vehicle. Get wonky, get in it, <laughs> go get that money, and you can help your community today. Uh, questions from the audience, please. Yes, you there. Yes, yes, you. Thank you. We have microphones. Woohoo. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Megan Miller, and um, I've got a background in anthropology. I'm going to read because I'm my. Heart is beating really fast, so I'm going to lose myself. Go for it. I've got a background in anthropology, psychology, um, biology, now studying dietetics at the University of the District of Columbia, mm -hmm. and just still not getting enough from one program. Um, so I'm increasingly involved in urban sustainability there. I, we have a farm stand in a food desert in Ward 8, just like a lot of people are doing. Um, so come on by. Um, so I, my question is for... Jonathan Parfrey, am I saying that right? Sure. Say it right. How do I say it? <laughs> or call me Nacho. Nacho. <laughs> so Nacho, <laughs> let's be honest. LA is a popular kid, just like New York, just like San Francisco, just like Miami. You guys are popular kids. So what you say is important because people follow. Mm -hmm. We're like mm -hmm. sheep. And that's a benefit in this, in this sense because we have a lot of information that we want to share. So, um, so this. Um, what do you do, um, what you do is important. How closely do the LA's Green New Deal goals acknowledge and align with the criticality of what, Jonathan Foley, where are you? Um, Brett Kugelmas, where are you? Um, Joseph Rahm, where are you? And others have described. Um, yes, integrated on local, state, and federal levels, great, love it. Um, I appreciate LA's leadership, but in what um, has since been described today, I am not yet convinced that LA's goals break through. Uh, would you please be more specific so that I may be more helpful about LA's thought leadership impact and be able to share that and be excited about it? If not, could you please, number one, 
for specificity, provide resources to close my ignorance gap, and number two, transparency. Acknowledge others who are your peers who are doing a more exacting job in addressing the criticality. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. <laughs> so that's a lot. Maybe we could take this offline, but yeah. I think the, the goal that has been articulated by Green New Deal here in DC has been to get to 100% renewables within 10 years. And what I described in Southern California was getting to 80% by that same date. And there is an acknowledgement that I would like to get it to 100%, but if one takes a, a view of the rest of the country, those other places aren't even close. My understanding of West Virginia is that it's 96% coal today. Mm. And so to get to even 20% renewables in a state like that is a huge leap. I think Los Angeles is setting a, a nice bar. I think California is setting a nice bar. It's the role of advocates, and I'm not representing the government. We're an advocacy organization, is to push them for more and sooner but with the recognition that we also need to model how other states can move in this direction without deleteriously impacting their current society um, that they currently have. So this is something that we're, we're trying to work on, love to take it offline. Uh, another question. Hi, oh, okay. Um, I'm Shannon with the Sustained Charlotte in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have the pleasure of working closely with Jennifer <laughs> for many years. Um, I had a couple of different questions, but uh, I'll, I'll try to just pick one here. Um, so we have, uh, as, as the mayor mentioned, uh, a new climate sort of plan at a very high level. But of course, putting together a plan is sort of the easy part. Implementation is the hard part. And as she also mentioned, we have a lot of siloization with, with the city and county. And Brendan, you know, since you're up, up there and you probably know Charlotte's park system is ranked and you're ranking at the bottom of the 100 cities that you, that you rank. So we have the worst park system in the country, worst economic mobility. We have, we have our, our, our challenges. But I'm curious about how we can, we can implement, um, if you have ideas for implementation of those climate policies or, or cities who are, you have seen do a really good job of implementing those, those plans. Um, particularly when you have this divided government. Um, the county, Mecklenburg County that Charlotte sits in, has, a, has the park department. The city doesn't have a park department. Um, so that's another example of the siloization of government. It's a, it's a real challenge how we can improve our park score, the Trust for Public Land Park score in Charlotte, given this, the city doesn't build parks but does all the land planning. So anyway, lots of different things in there, but just any ideas or models on how you uh, cities that have done a really good job of implementing their, their climate plans and. Um, sort of how they, what the keys to success were. Thank you. Well, there's a bunch there too. Um, I mean, I think it comes back to the big picture of, you know, the more people, the more voices coming from more parts of the community that are taking those concerns about the lack of pace, the fact that our parks are at this level, why aren't we at this level? We, we can see better models around the country. That, that advocacy is, and I think that's in part what you guys are doing, right? But building that up and reaching out and building a broader coalition is, is critical. Um, and, but, but I think, um, you know, obviously we're focused on parks, trails, community forests, you know, things that um, are green. But I, but I think that those and similar projects, maybe it's, you know, community solar or other things that people can touch and feel and do now. I think it's, it's critical that when you go say, uh, when you take concerns to local leaders or others, they be specific about, we want to do this today. So we, we have now uh, about 250 mayors that have made a, a commitment to join a 10-minute walk campaign. That means they want to get a park within a 10-minute walk of everyone in their community. And it's a pledge, but you ask them to take the pledge and then say, where's your first park going to be? Or from an emissions perspective, they make a climate pledge, and you say, where's your first community solar? installation going to be, and, and something that is physical and real, and in addition to the long-term goals, gets people uh, focused and motivated around, um, you know, the exciting opportunities there are. Thank you. It's not a panacea, but it's a suggestion. We yeah. are out of time. Are we, out of time? Uh, we are out of time, because we really respect you guys, and we know you're hungry, and <laughs> we have a little bit more programming to do. Time more program to go. So, 
Let's, um, let's join uh, in thanking this amazing panel, which I'm part of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.